Okay, we're a bit ahead of time. Thank you for uh, coming to Policy Exchange for this event on human rights reform. This is a subject that we retain a strong interest in. Last year we published our paper on this subject, Bringing Rights Back Home. The author, Michael Fintoczynski, is on the panel today. I won't say much more other than to mention that we are doing further work in this area, looking at what a future human rights settlement might look like, and hopefully some of the speakers today will sketch out some of the political and policy issues that need to be grappled with. But uh, today's event is being chaired by John Rental from The Independent, and we aim to wrap up at about 2.15. But uh, there'll be time for questions as well. Thanks. Right, well, thank you very much. Uh, under the starter's orders, um, I'll just say, I've got to switch this thing on, have I? There we go. Uh, right, yes, I'm John Rental. I, uh, I'm uh, the arch Blairite, the uh, last remaining uh, Blairite uh, columnist in uh, what used to be Fleet Street uh, <laughs> on the Independent on Sunday. Um, there are only two things I disagree with Tony Blair about, and that's uh, Europe and religion, so that's pretty much everything, <laughs> actually. Um, I'm a fairly recent, uh, well I've come out fairly recently as a Eurosceptic, uh, I always, I always had, my, had my doubts, I never would have voted in a referendum to adopt the Euro, um, but one of the things that, uh, that helped turn me was the, was the Blair government's experience of uh, human rights law, uh, and it's interesting how you know, Tony Blair himself, Jack Straw, David Luckett, all, all his home secretaries, Charles Clark, all uh, despite being pro-Europeans themselves, I think Jack Straw may be questionable, uh, all ended up intensely frustrated with, uh, with um, uh, human rights uh, legislating, legislation emanating from, uh, from Strasbourg. I've only got one joke, so I better tell it quickly. How many human rights lawyers does it take to change a light bulb? You only need one to tell you, oh, you can't do that. <laughs> um, so the rest of this discussion is going to be entirely serious. Sorry about that. Um, I do apologise. Um, I'm going to introduce the guests. I've been given a running order. We have uh, Dominic Ra, uh, who was a lawyer at uh, Lake Nature, has worked for the Foreign Office on uh, war crimes tribunals, and has worked for David Davis and Dominic Grieve, and therefore knows both sides of the argument. Is that fair? Um, Austin. Morgan is a barrister in London, Belfast. I've known for a long time. Wrote, a, wrote an excellent biography of uh, Harold Wilson. Uh, was an independent member of David Cameron's uh, Bill of Rights Commission before the election. There have been two Bill of Rights Commissions, one after the election set up by the Coalition and one before the election set up by the Conservative Party. Uh, and. Uh, that one was described by Kenneth Clark as xenophobic and anti-foreign. I think he, he, said, he said the anti-foreign a bit in case you didn't understand what xenophobic means. Uh, then we've got Jesse Norman, who uh, co-wrote with Peter O'Born, one of my favourite journalists. That's, just, that's, that's irony, I think. Um, a pamphlet uh, called Churchill's Legacy, uh, the Conservative Case of the Human Rights Act, all about how Winston Churchill wrote the convention himself in his own blood. Um, and then uh, I shall be introducing Michael Peter Jasinski, who wrote a, um, you know, a really, really important uh, essay for Policy Exchange. When was that? Last year. Um, really sort of moving the argument on, I think, on, uh, on what specifically can be done about uh, both the Convention and the Court. My personal position is that Britain should stay a signatory to the Convention because, of course, Winston Churchill wrote it, uh, but repudiate the Court because I don't think there's any way of, uh, of finessing that one ultimately, but uh, I shall leave it to the experts to tell you uh, what else might possibly be done. So let's start with Dominic Rupp. John, thank you very much, and uh, thanks to Policy Exchange again for organising a very timely and topical subject. Um, with Qatar and Brighton, the Brighton Conference in the press this week, and obviously very live, I want to really address those two issues square on. What do they mean in terms of uh, the idea of reform of human rights, and in particular, uh, not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. 
I'm a Chelsea fan, so I'm waiting for this evening with sort of eager anticipation as they take on Barcelona in the Champions League semi-final. And the one thing I don't want them to do is stick in their own half and try and defend. And I suppose the metaphor I'm going to use is that if we do that on it tonight, and if we do that in this country on human rights, we are very unlikely to get the result we want. My, my central theme is not entirely different from John's, um, is that, and I think the events this week illustrate that the Strasbourg court is a boa constrictor. The more you sort of half-heartedly wriggle, the tighter its grip becomes. And I want to explain why I think this week, very topically, bears that out. So firstly, Katana. First thing I must do is praise Theresa May for very deftly handling a lousy set of cards that she's been dealt and that she's inherited from the last government. Uh, the government's position is that Katana is now in detention, that we cannot deport him until he's exhausted all his appeals, both in the UK and I think the implicit uh, point of the statement yesterday is potentially more broadly, so the appeals to, to Strasbourg. And I think that is actually a major shift, not just in policy, but in British constitutional approach. Our constitution, Britain's constitution, is based on a dualist theory of international law, which means that if the UK courts want to know what these opaque international obligations mean, what they are, it's, it's, they need to have some practical means of doing it. So this isn't really a theological issue. And what they do under a dualist theory is they look to UK law as interpreted by the UK courts. Leave aside the EU for a moment, which is different. And what I think we are, being, we, we are saying is that actually, um, and, and my view would be is that if the UK court, and I think that he's got to be able, Qatar has got to be able to exhaust his domestic procedures, but if actually, because we've been down this road once before, if the UK courts decide actually he should be deported, then I would have him sooner or later on a plane back to Oman. But yesterday, uh, the Home Secretary set out the government's position, and it's based on the idea that even once we've exhausted the UK appeals, he could issue, uh, or he could apply for what's called a Rule 39 injunction from Strasbourg and, uh, and prevent us from deporting him until uh, uh, that he has another crack at Strasbourg, which could take months, if not potentially years, depending on how quickly they get their act together. Now, the point I want to make is actually, this idea of a Rule 39 injunction is a serious issue, and I've never heard it put in quite this way before. Um, Rule 39, and I've got the rules here, uh, it's the rules of procedure of the Strasbourg Court, they can provide recommendations that if an applicant is trying to appeal to the Strasbourg Court, what the UK or any other national government should do in the meantime to preserve their position. Uh, these are recommendations, they're not even expressed in the rules as an instruction, and there's no basis in the convention for them. But Strasbourg has itself interpreted the own, its own rules of procedure which it created as giving rise to a binding power of injunction. Did this in a ruling in 2005. I think it's a very good example of how, of yet another piece of judicial legislation. Certainly no state thought it was signing up to give Strasbourg injunction power, injunctive power over, uh, over, over national authorities. But still, if we retain our historic dualist position, which is that uh, this wouldn't have any force as a matter of UK law unless the UK courts say it does, then actually it would be unenforceable. And we could allow a Katada to go through his UK appeals process at SIAC and if necessary beyond. And uh, we could then deport him straight away without waiting for this big Strasbourg rigmarole again. Um, and ultimately, I think the point I'm trying to make is that whether or not we comply with Rule 39 is a political decision, not a strictly enforceable legal one. The argument was made yesterday in the House of Commons that actually if we ignored one of these Rule 39 uh, uh, recommendations, uh, we would be rendering ministers and officials in breach of the law. And I think uh, that is a rather tenuous link to the code of conduct which applies to ministers and civil servants. And effectively, um, what that says is that ministers and officials shouldn't break the law. Now that's fine, but if you have a dualist theory of international law, they're not breaking the law. If the UK courts say they're not breaking the law, the idea that you would then look at what international tribunals say just to check, it defeats the whole purpose of our constitution. Um, I've never heard it expressed 
that a, a violation or a breach of an, inter, an interim recommendation from the international court, EU aside, could violate UK law and therefore leave officials and ministers in violation of UK law. It is a massive constitutional precedent. Um, it is true, of course, that presumably ministers and officials are already in breach of law for not allowing prisoners through to the polling booths at election time. Um, so I would question the premise, and I actually think we should take a far more robust approach. Uh, once the UK courts have endorsed deportation, if indeed they do, he should be on a plane. And if we have to go to the courts, and this comes back to our footballing analogy, to assert that very robustly, we should. And there's of course a risk that courts may decide things you don't like, but we need to reaffirm our sovereignty and in doing so take a fairly robust position in the courts. If necessary, we ought to clarify the codes of conduct because they were surely never intended to cover this sort of scenario. Instead, we're sort of half-heartedly wriggling. And whilst I think in the short term we've had a decent result in Abu Qatada, um, I fear that the Strasbourg grip is ever tightening and the coils are tightening and we need to break its vice-like grip. Um, I don't know how much time I've got left, but I, I just wanted to briefly refer to the Brighton Conference this week. The Bill of Rights Commission, and Michael may say more on this shortly, came up with a very good, sensible, modest, moderate list of reforms of the Strasbourg Court, which would allow us to stay within the Convention, but refocus the Strasbourg Court. It has cross-party membership. Lady uh, Elena Kennedy is on it. Lord Leicester is on it. So this isn't all right-wing, rabid, tear-up human rights uh, uh, agenda. And there are two key things they reckon that needed to be in reform of the Strasbourg Court, and I think they're the litmus test for a successful conference. We need a, a declaration that makes clear we're moving towards an amendment of the Convention to focus Strasbourg on the worst violations of human rights and stopping them from second-guessing our Supreme Court and our democratic parliament um, when it takes decisions which are fine decisions and, and where actually we ought to have a greater margin of appreciation. And the second, so that's a screening mechanism that needs to go into the convention through an amending protocol. And the second thing is to spell out the margin of appreciation so that the court has a very clear mandate to take these concerns on board. It looks like, and I don't think we should judge what's in the media, but it looks like a lot of this language will just be relegated to political language in the declaration. And um, the question is therefore begged if that is the outcome, what impact it will have on the Strasbourg court. The truth is that if it's not an amendment to the Convention, it will be much, much less. Still may have some influence, still may nudge the court in, in, in the right direction. And I think in the short term, they're responding politically anyway. We saw that with the Andrew Hamza decision. But over the long term, it will be much, much less. My, my view of, of the conference is that even now, to get to a single declaration signed up to by 47 states is a massive success for the government. I'd give them 9 out of 10 for diplomatic elbow grease. But in terms of its likely impact on the Strasbourg Court, in terms of results, in terms of what this conference and seminar is all about, I think it's probably likely to score four out of ten over the long run. And I think the court will go back to its sort of ever-growing judicial legislation. My conclusion is that we need to be honest, we need to under-promise and over-deliver. And I think the net political effect of this week is that we are seeing Strasbourg strengthen its coils and reel against any uh, change to its mandate. And one of the main reasons the stronger language is being relegated to political language at the Brighton Conference is not because member states uh, directly disagree, it's because a lot of them are going and asking the Strasbourg Court, are you happy with this? And they're saying, no, we're not. And that is why some of the dilution is taking place. And I think it's crazy that we're actually in a negotiation with the court about its mandate rather than with the democratic nation states that set it up. Thank you very much. Um, Austin's a, a human rights barrister and an expert will now tell us what to say. Um, well, I am a working barrister. That does make me a human rights lawyer, but I do support the idea of a United you know, Kingdom Bill of Rights and Responsibilities for constitutional reasons. I want to make four points. The first one concerns the Council of Europe, which I've been studying now for a number of years. Uh, the Council is actually a victim of success, and the European Court of Human Rights is the part of the Council that has suffered from this success the most. The Court, quite frankly, though no one has ever said it, is in crisis. Um, looking back, it would have been better if Strasbourg had just been about state versus state, and we promoted human rights in that way. 
Secondly, uh, international diplomacy is done much better by the Council of Ministers at Strasbourg and by the unelected parliamentary assembly than it is by the 47 judges there. And third, the right of individual petition, which we've had since the late 1960s, means that Sir Nicholas Bratza, all the UK and the President of Strasbourg, effectively micromanages the justice systems of 47 member states. 47 member states have difficulty enough micromanaging one justice system to have 47 judges in Strasbourg trying to manage 47 systems. Well, we see the result break down. Um, I should mention one case which you won't have heard of. It's Horn Castle. It was decided in 2009. And I think it's of extraordinary political and constitutional significance. In 2009, the Supreme Court stood up to Strasbourg on the question of whether you had to have cross-examination in criminal trials. Now, the effect of the standing up was the UK said, we want a margin of appreciation for our unique criminal justice system. Now, conceivably, arguably, it depends upon what happens, the UK judiciary, by standing up to Strasbourg and forcing Strasbourg to back down in recent weeks, may well have broken the subordination of domestic judges to international judges. In other words, I'm trying to say, the courts may well have fought the battle that the executive branch of government is trying to fight, but is in its early stages. Um, I'm all in favor of reform of Strasbourg. I do accept the doctrine of subsidiarity, as does Strasbourg, and I think the effect means that there will be a shift of the balance of power from Strasbourg to the member states. And if the member states won't get their human rights acts together, the Council of Europe, through the ministers and through the parliamentary assembly, should take action against them. One state in Europe is locked out of the Council of Europe. For the life of me, I do not know why Russia was ever admitted to the Council of Europe. If it had a reason for getting into the Council of Europe, it should have been forced to reform itself on a specified agenda as a condition my second point is, uh, well, when you're in the jungle and you see a beast and it doesn't have a name, give it a name. So my second point concerns our human rights community, which in fact is an international community, comprising NGOs, some academics, quangocrats, and I'm afraid to say state bureaucrats, some state bureaucrats. Um, one cannot discuss human rights today without discussing this beast in the jungle. Um, it has engaged in extraordinary rhetorical excess over those of us who are arguing for reform of the Strasbourg system and more constructively and positively for the UK Bill of Rights and Responsibility. With the human rights community, we're in the realm of ideology and politics and Aaron is teacher, legal academic in the Lords, has actually characterized this now as a religious movement. My first degree was in sociology. I understand what religions are, and I concur. The human rights community does behave like a religious community. So I'm held captive for two days in a conference uh, at Westminster. I know I have the manners not to say anything and to behave myself, but I do feel I'm living amongst a group of people of faith which I do not subscribe. I have the privilege of observing them from the inside, but there is no point in engaging in intellectual theological debate. Uh, this is a veritable fourth branch of government. I favor a state that only has the usual three branches of government. My third point is, what the hell would a UK Bill of Rights and Responsibilities look like? Well, I've tried to work it out. Um, and I've tried to find other people who will engage with me, but none of the human rights community, despite all the professors they have, really wants to or could devote any intellectual energy to the project. Um, I published a paper recently, it's on my website, austinmorgan.com, and that's about all I will say, other than two things. One, um, I do favor constructing our own Bill of Rights. It'd be based on Commonwealth Bills of Rights, it'd be based on the European Convention, and it'd be based on the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. It would look homegrown and would seek to have a legitimacy rooted in our history 
rooted in our politics. Why? Because I want our people to support human rights and I want the issue removed from the area of political contestation where it has been since 2000. Um, I have one particular cause I do want to advance. I do want to advance the idea that people abuse other people's human rights and it's not just states that violate human rights. If I were to jump across the room and strangle Roger Smith because he doesn't look favorably upon me, his relatives could go to court and get a declaration, but the declaration wouldn't be that Austin Morgan abused his Article 2 right by killing him without any provocation at all or warning to the police. Uh, the declaration they would get is that the UK state, which should have known that Austin Morgan would have done something like that to Roger Smith, um, um, gave Roger Smith inadequate protection today, and therefore Roger Smith's relatives are entitled to £10,000 because there's an inadequate investigation. Because when people looked at the dead Roger Smith, they said, right, that's the end of the matter, we're taking it no further, we're not going to waste any public time and money on it. I think Austin Morgan should be held liable uh, under a declaration of a court, and Austin Morgan or his next of kin should be held liable to the relatives of Roger Smith. That, that's enough on that, but that's quite a radical human rights statement, which takes us much further than the human rights we've had for some time. My fourth point, now this does take me beyond the debate, because I'm going to refer to the European Union, and I'm going to refer to the Charter of Fundamental Rights. Why? Because they're there. On the 1st of December 2009, the Charter became part of the European treaties. And then, through our European Communities Act 1972, Parliament made the Fundamental Charter part of our domestic law. It's there and has been for some time. One does not know what is going to happen to the European Union. Maybe I would get a round of applause if I predicted its demise. Maybe old people say he's a good chap, he's got a very solid head on his shoulders. He said the European Union is going to prosper through the 21st century. I frankly don't know, but I'll point to three legal issues. Um, one is that the European Union is engaging, I think, in a reverse takeover of the Council of Europe. Therefore, it is desirable to talk about whether the Council of Europe does actually have a future. One will have a 27-state core within the 47 states of the Council of Europe. That will produce a very interesting dynamic on how the Council of Europe functions. Secondly, the UK and Poland, uh, not normal bedfellows, got a proto protocol in the Lisbon Treaty. Well, the protocol, all it did was clarify what the treaty said. And there's nothing in the protocol that would actually stop the <coughs> fundamental charter having further effect in the UK outside European competences if a European government wanted to do that. What would be stopped would be a court doing it behind the back of the executive branch of government. And the third and final point on the fundamental charter is good human rights lawyers, amongst whom I hope I am included, think less of Strasbourg these days and much more of Luxembourg. If you want a human rights victory for your client and you can bring it into the European treaties in one way or other, go to the judges in the Court of Justice of the European Union. Your chances are better, you'll get a better result and the decision will have been made not in an abstract human rights context as in Strasbourg, but in a context of the totality of social and economic policy. So my four points again, in case you've forgotten them. The first is, I think we should look at the Council of Europe historically as beyond its sell by date. That's generally the Council. Um, my second point is that the human rights community is the beast, which believes it has a monopoly on this issue, and therefore I think people like myself uh, should actually stand up to them and not show fear. My third point is that I'm much more interested in constructive work on a UK, and I do mean UK, <laughs> Bill of Rights and Responsibilities, and I do mean responsibilities, and I've tried to do some practical work and my fourth point is we do we cannot avoid discussing the European Union because that's altering the international geography which will have
consequence for the UK. So thank you very much for permitting me to be heretical, though I lack the courage to do it amongst the true believers across the street. <laughs> Thank you very much, Charleston. That was uh, absolutely fascinating. Uh, we're very fortunate that we've got uh, two of the brightest stars of the uh, Parliamentary Conservative Party here today, and the other one is uh, Jesse Norman. Uh, uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, John, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Let me just pause for a second to turn on this device. Can you hear me? Let's yep. move this up. See, no worries. Something's become a Nat King Cole concert. Um, I'm from here. Um, right. So, here we go. Um, thank you very much indeed, ladies and gentlemen, for having me along. I am, I'm afraid, um, uh, 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 here under hopelessly false pretenses, I'm not a lawyer. I know virtually nothing about the case law. I'm extraordinarily ignorant about um, the law of the European Community or the European Council, or Council of Europe. Um, uh, and Ideally so qualified to be a member of Parliament. Well, um, um, <laughs> learning fast, thank you, Austin. Um, on the other hand, it does save me from um, mistakes. Um, uh, uh, let me just, I, I'm someone who's uh, really comes to this as a philosopher and historian. Um, and let me on your behalf, ladies and gentlemen, congratulate the first congratulate our chairman, John Rental, on his, the next stage of his movement towards full conservatism. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, um, uh, I, I'm here really as a, as a man who wrote or co-wrote the um, sort of pamphlet Churchill's Legacy, um, which advances the correct proposition that the Human Rights Act, far from being a charter for state socialism, is in fact, uh, in many ways, a rather conservative document. And not only conservative um, in its ideas uh, and its history and motivation, but also actually, as a matter of fact, introduced um, a, set of, a set of rights under a conservative government um, in 1951. Uh, through a conservative-led process of the, uh, judicial development. So what I want to do then is to, is to attack a series of key ideas and bring out one or two other points that have been raised, and then see what I think, and then do something which I think will be rather equally critical, which is try to answer the question, <laughs> where next the human rights? So the, the first question I want to attack is the idea that it's somehow right-wing to want to tear up human rights. I think that's absolute nonsense. Um, if you look in British history, um, which is in many ways um, in our constitutional development an impeccably conservative thing, it represents a continuous desire to restrain radicalism while enfranchising and extending human freedom, um, then uh, you will see that the rights in the Human Rights Act, with one, one and a half exceptions, two exceptions, come out of our common law uh, inheritance. Um, that is to say, have a, have a historical uh, basis that is as much as six or seven hundred years old. Um, and not only that, but the idea of rights as undergirding freedoms are themselves, is itself a very conservative idea. If you read Edmund Burke, you'll find it um, everywhere in Burke, you'll find it in Blackstone, you'll find it in Dicey, you'll find it in the great jurists of the 18th and 19th century. Um, and, and certainly, uh, you'll find it in, in the 20th century. And it's quite important to distinguish that rights tradition from a certain other way of reflecting about rights, which is, I would argue, rather left-wing and, and also rather unhelpful um, to us as a country. So uh, my argument would be that um, we shouldn't, we don't need a British Bill of Rights because as regards the rights themselves, we have a Bill of Rights, it's called the Human Rights Act. And if we were in the United States, there would be no doubt about this. People would think of Madison's um, amazing down scene moment in 1789 when he realizes that the US Constitution in 1787 does not contain substantive protections for the individual and therefore needs to be supplemented by a further element in the American Constitution, uh, which becomes the Bill of Rights. And he then personally championed the first, well, uh, the first 10 amendments of the Bill of Rights itself um, and takes them to the state legislatures and they are widely celebrated as the great substantive protections within that legal framework. Um, and something similar is true here. The trouble is the arguments become uh, completely beset by a certain kind of ignorance and misinformation. And if anyone's interested, um, a lot of that ignorance and misinformation, at least in my opinion, is dispelled by um, this pamphlet. And um, it actually isn't some sort of reason on my website, jessinorman.com, but it is on the Liberty website. And um, you can get it there, and I'll put it up on my website soon. Um, uh, and amongst those ignorance, and things are not just factual misrepresentations as to where the Human Rights Act, for which I do not hold an unconditional brief in any means. I'm really talking about as a set of ideas, um, uh, and I'll come on to some criticisms of it in a moment. Um, but if you look on that, you'll see that we dispel certain factual mistakes that were made about 
the application of the rights act. We also just felt certainly as it were governmental large as governing ideas. So one would be that somehow the Human Rights Act is an expression of the European Union. So I do the European Union, one of the indirect relationship. Uh, or that the Human Rights Act provides the ability for judges to strike down legislation, whereas of course nothing can be further from the truth that doesn't do that. It just allows for judges to refer legislation. Parliament passes the legislation, Parliament's fully at will. We could, as parliamentarians, uh, overturn on a um, uh, simple majority vote in both houses any of the Act of Settlement. Um, you know, in the next few days, if Parliament was so minded. So we have that's a cunning attempt to disturb my notes, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> and, um, um, but, but we don't do that. The reason we don't do that is because actually the setup is, is broadly acceptable as it is. So um, I think the Human Rights Act then is, in some respects, a highly conservative document, product of the common law, in many ways an expression of human substantive freedoms against state intervention rooted in our history. And of those, and I'm just going to focus on this for a second because it sets up where I want to go in terms of where our own human rights uh, uh, reform should develop. But uh, if, if uh, so when the debate, when this was published originally in 2008, you know, one had a simple way of essentially inducing um, self-contradiction in people who objected to this, which was to say, which rights would you propose to cut? Well, it turns out that no one really wants to cut many, or indeed any of the rights um, in the Human Rights Act, with the possible exception of the right to privacy, the right to family life, you can, that's, that's arguable in the arguments on both sides um, uh, of it. Um, 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 there are certainly places where people want to extend the rights, they want to expand it. They'd like to say a trial by jury rather than just um, uh, a right to a fair trial. So uh, that's, um, uh, so the first question is which rights would like to cut. The second question would be um, if you want to uh, resolve from the repeal the treaty or resolve from the treaty, um, do you also want to resolve from the convention? Well, actually, no one wants to do that. Um, um, uh, with one or two um, unusual exceptions. Very few people, certainly no one in government, uh, wants to do that, and very few people across the major political parties want to do that for a very good reason. Puts us out there with Yemen, North Korea, and other great um, rights in franchising and supporting uh, countries, um, and also uh, uh, gives us no reason to have any kind of argument um, with Russia or others who might be uh, less interested in zealously preserving individual rights than we are. Um, and the third reason is if you really want to, get, if you want to stay with the convention, then don't you think it'd be a good idea for these judges uh, to be British judges deciding these things at low expense quickly in British courts rather than foreign judges deciding them incompetently in foreign courts? So that's, um, that's, that's the bull case for the Human Rights Act. I absolutely do not suggest how I'm arguing for the value of the rights. I'm not arguing um, for the jurisprudence. And that's where I think there are some issues that we need to address and where I think the future lies. And I'm not pleased that one of the the argument seems to be accepting, broadly speaking, the position that we've adopted in the paper. That's to say, people are less critical now to the rights than they were, they're more knowledgeable about the issue, but they are very much focused on the jurisprudence. Um, and so what, what does that mean? Well, just to bring it up to date, I, I very much support the government's uh, desire to prune back the European uh, Court of Human Rights. I think that's entirely right. It brings us back to an original Goalist perspective of our position within a rights framework as a, as a political framework, which is you know, the Gaulle's famous picture of Europe as an Europe des patries, a Europe of nation states, rather than a federalizing one government from the center. Uh, so it's consistent with that. There are other targets within our, own, um, within our own country. I think if we want to fight rights inflation, I look forward to the government really attacking the idea of how a culture of rights has expanded in our own public administration, in central government and the local government in the Quangos. I think that's a very important area for us to do, and hitherto rather ignored. Um, there are three other things, I think, or four other things I'd just like to mention in terms of where I think the, the argument can go. The first is, we actually have a real job of regaining public support for the ideas of the substantive freedoms of the individual, of rights as freedoms in that sense. Very important. We have not, that argument hasn't been made at all. Most of human rights have been dragged through the gutter over the last few years, um, and largely by the tabloid press. And, and that needs to be restored. And um, again, you know, I think Magna Carta, you know, anniversary in um, uh, you know, 2015 gives us an opportunity to relaunch the conception of a person's uh, personal freedoms and rights as something that we should be, as the originators, intensely proud of. Um, the second thing is, I, I hope my colleagues, the political politicians, will just relax in their attacks on British judges. I mean, the facts are that our judges are, are almost without any questioning the best in the world. Um, uh, of course, it's in the nature of the common law system that in tough cases and decisions, Lord Reed famously pointed out, will, will make new law. That's the nature of the common law system. 
Um, uh, uh, you can't get away from that. That is a million miles away from judicial legislation. And it is staggering that when people talk about um, uh, 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 judges as making laws, uh, how, how bad the examples tend to be. So I think in general we should relax on our own judges who buy and do an excellent job. I don't say that it's perfect by any means, very far from it, but I think we should just take a more sympathetic and thoughtful view. I personally regard the idea of a rights and responsibilities bill or anything similar to that as advocated by the Green Paper, the last government uh, in um, 2009, as hopelessly misconceived and intellectually <coughs> catastrophic. Personally, we have, at least in the British historical system, speaking as a as a historical philosopher, we have one responsibility, the responsibility is to bring the law. Um, and we also have moral obligations, obligations of character, obligations of moral value, and those things um, uh, uh, should also bind us. But the idea that we somehow have written, rights, uh, written responsibilities, but apart from the fact that no one's actually been able to enumerate them with any uh, credible uh, force, more than uh, you know, the right to vote, for example, I, I just, or not to vote, I, I personally regard that as nonsense. Um, and the third thing, and the final thing we should do is avoid or mitigate or fight against the pervasive and pernicious effects of the EU Charter. And the EU Charter is, is again something that falls on the other side of the basic rights and freedoms that I am defending, our constitutional, the things, the common law rights that have grown up in this country. It falls, it falls far on the other side. And indeed, it, is a, it has been described as a, as a charter which um, gives to every human being um, governed by the opportunity to have a headhunter um, you know, could, you know, on their own behalf. Now, you know, I, I just don't want to get into the detail of it, but there's enough detail in it to make one extremely suspicious of the EU Charter. So the counterpart of the argument that I'm making is, let's stick with what we know we have and what we've always had, which is a common law rights tradition of enormous integrity and value. Let us celebrate that, let us support it, and let us be vigorous in our repudiation of threats to it uh, and of competing uh, and uh, unattractive <coughs> models. Thank you very much. Last month, resigned from the government's uh, commission on the Bill of Human Thank you very much, uh, John. I, I just wanted to make one uh, rejoinder uh, from Jesse's uh, talk, with which I agreed almost entirely. But I just uh, want to point out one thing that under the Human Rights Act, uh, it is certainly true that when the judges pass a declaration of incompatibility. In other words, that they say that some subsequent action or law is incompatible with the Human Rights Act, that Parliament isn't automatically obliged to do anything. And so to that extent, uh, we don't have uh, what is called strong judicial <coughs> review, the uh, direct strike down power. However, uh, we, we do have that in practicality because anybody who wins a case in British courts, uh, and then uh, the British Parliament uh, refuses to alter British law uh, in line with the, with, with the decision of the courts, can go to Strasbourg with the pretty well 100% assurance that Strasbourg will back uh, that case, uh, having been judged by the British judges in Strasbourg, so if the British uh, executive and the British Parliament refuses to follow the uh, British judges, they will then lose in Strasbourg. Uh, and so Parliament doesn't have a free choice. And I think that is the fundamental <coughs> catch uh, in the uh, architectural, uh, the constitutional architecture of the Human Rights Act. Uh, and that, uh, that's the only point on which I would uh, disagree with you, Jesse, but it is a fairly fundamental point. Uh, now, uh, just to come to the brief remarks that I'll make. Uh, first, a senior consultant on constitutional affairs to policy exchange, uh, that, which, uh, which is a new appointment of mine. I've been asked to undertake a number of studies on public appointments, party funding, voter registration, and human rights. In general, uh, I'm a defender of the Westminster model of parliamentary democracy. Some changes are needed, but in general, believers in our parliamentary democracy have not done nearly enough to present a carefully researched 
an argued alternative to some fashionable reformist measures. Uh, a key part in the forthcoming uh, policy exchange program of constitutional study will be discussion and dialogue across party lines and across the divide between political scientists <coughs> and practitioners. And I'm most grateful to Policy Exchange for this timely and important initiative. And I hope that many of you will feel able to take part in that dialogue uh, in coming months. Now, on human rights, I, I really have only one uh, main point. Uh, and uh, that is, despite what Joshua Rosenberg has rightly called the toxic character, of many of the current debates in the UK, uh, there is in fact very little basic disagreement about the crucial importance of human rights. Uh, and that is something that I think uh, Jesse has just said, I think that all of our other speakers have, have said this. The disagreement now is about the appropriate way to implement uh, human rights. Uh, to be effective, the guarantee of human rights uh, requires obviously an independent judiciary, I believe both in London and preferably in Strasbourg as well. Uh, but it needs in addition to enjoy the support of our democratically elected legislature. We really do need to listen to and respect the views of MPs on matters of policy uh, because they are a, a, a major elected branch of government uh, uh, and they embody our democracy. Uh, it's for judges to decide particular cases without pressure, but some generic cases such as voting rights for prisoners uh, that, that come very close to or cross the line uh, uh, betwe uh, between the judicial and legislative role. Uh, and, I, and I think there is a case for saying that it should be for the House of Commons to discuss broad policy issues uh, such as that. Uh, therefore, there needs to be some right of last resort for override by the legislature of political decisions by judges. Now, I could go into the nature uh, of, uh, of such an override, uh, and in honesty, there's a lot of work uh, to be done for that. Uh, all I'll say now uh, is that such an override should be exceptional uh, rather than a routine legislative response. In other words, one shouldn't casually be able to say, we don't like the judgment, therefore, uh, too bad, we will, uh, uh, we will disregard it. Uh, 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 it. It has to be a, a stronger process than that. Uh, I'm uh, talking, say, at the extreme about the type of thing that happened in the United States when the Supreme Court said that uh, uh, slaves were chattels and there was nothing you could do about it and they had a civil war uh, before there was a change in the Constitution. I think that this, uh, there are cases where you need to have some override of unwise decisions by uh, a, a, a judiciary, uh, provided that there is some uh, incorporation of a last resort override into the current system, uh, then uh, um, I think that uh, my preference uh, is for us to remain uh, signed up to the Strasbourg Court on that uh, basis. Uh, I think we would only need to consider withdrawal if that, uh, that last minute override uh, and sorry, this last resort override uh, will not to become available. Now, this week, the issue of legislative override is not on the agenda of the high-level conference due to convening Brighton tonight. Uh, the draft Brighton Declaration makes clear that under the present system, uh, and following the passage uh, in 1998 of our Human Rights Act, it's the Strasbourg Court, which, uh, in its words, authoritatively interprets the European Convention on Human Rights. It also makes clear that signatories to the European Convention on Human Rights are obliged to enforce 
uh, decisions of the Strasbourg Court. Thus, the current negotiations don't address the fundamental problem of constitutional architecture which the Human Rights Act has created. Certainly, there are some, uh, I suppose, temporary improvements which may be achieved, and I specifically want to pay tribute to our ambassador in Strasbourg, uh, Eleanor Fuller, to some excellent UK civil servants who've been involved uh, in the uh, negotiations, and indeed to judges and senior staff in Strasbourg. I don't see any personal problem uh, uh, on, uh, on this. I think the problem is the underlying problem of constitutional architecture, which has nothing to do with the goodwill and capacity uh, of the main actors to these negotiations, which I wouldn't in any way uh, wish uh, to question. Uh, I think that we will need to address the inbuilt conflict between parliamentary uh, sovereignty and the final authority of the Strasbourg Court if there's to be any permanent solution. Uh, therefore, in coming to, the, to where we go from here, uh, I think that we need to have a calm discussion of these underlying constitutional issues, uh, free from the view that the European Convention on Human Rights is itself under threat, which I don't believe it is. It, it's the application that we need to, uh, to, uh, to look to. Uh, I think that, it, that there are questions about democracy and human rights uh, and the protection, of, indeed, of minority rights in a democracy and the role of parliaments versus judges, and, and that those deserve some uh, some very calm and detailed uh, reflection away from the cameras, so to speak. Uh, and I hope that that can take place over coming months. Now, I don't expect that there will be anything basic that will happen uh, in this parliament, because there's too much disagreement. Uh, we do need to consider whether there are interim measures that can be agreed uh, within the coalition. I think that it's sensible that, that if uh, the Liberal Democrat and Conservative parts of the coalition really have differing views on the fundamental architecture, that uh, we should agree to differ on those and see whether there are any more temporary measures, maybe about the right to family life, maybe there are various things that we can uh, agree on uh, in, in, in the interim while those longer term discussions also go on. And so I hope that that is a possibility as well. And I, I hope that, uh, that I, I do endorse what others have said, that the Charter of Fundamental Rights is something that needs to be brought onto the agenda of discussion in a much more detailed and active way over the coming months. Uh, I naturally hope that this discussion will take place in a less toxic atmosphere than there has been so far. Uh, and, uh, and I think, I hope I speak for my uh, new colleagues at Policy Exchange that we very much welcome that ongoing debate. Thank you. Um, right, questions. Let's move swiftly on. For if you could um, ask really difficult questions and say who you are. Uh, I'm Roger Smith, and I should announce my uh, resurrection. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I, I want to raise two questions, which I think the panel is rather left behind. First is, I thought it was a terribly domestic, narrow presentation. I don't think you can be British uh, and a UK citizen without necessarily having an engagement in the world. And this is the day uh, when we saw the release of the papers from Kenya, Malaysia. Barack Obama's father, if he hadn't been killed in a car accident, could well have an action against the British government as a result of papers. A whole history of that. Uh, Jack Straw is against the Human Rights Act. Well, uh, he's facing litigation in relation to breach of Article 3 and the, uh, the extradition of the sending back of Dal Marsh. Uh, the, the, in, there are issues here about the international engagement with the UK. 
what nobody has said about the, the Council of Europe and the European Court is that one of the things it has done brilliantly is it has helped to cool and to, in a sense, pacify the eastern borders of Europe. With the, with the, it's a totally different issue from anything anybody's raised. But I mean, it may have <laughs> to appeal to you to But it has you know, Ukraine, Moldova, uh, these kind of places I'm saying. Even that, after an extent, dreadfully, you know, woe be gone and uh, terrible places. But the Council of Europe, European Court, the real world in holding them together, tenuously in relation to Russia, and that's been in our national interest, and I think that's been an internationalism. Secondly, in relation to the court, yeah, Roger, no, you can't, can't interview you. <laughs> I didn't mean that you were talking. The no, second point I want to make is how you read the court. My read of the court was our court, the uh, Supreme Court, was caught on the hop by the war against terror, caught on the hop by the greater uh, prominence given to the European Convention by the HRA, took some time to respond, and eventually did. And it took some to and fro, but actually it got to a reasonable position. And the Belmarsh judgment was a reasonable judgment, the other judgment that came out. What it exposed in that process is the weakness of our constitution, which is we have the supremacy of parliament, and we therefore have an executive, which by very definition can control the legislature. And it was grappling with that really difficult issue, and that's why it's taking so much time. What we're now seeing is the European Court, those cases coming through the European Court, and actually, if we were to put it crudely on sides, hey, you're running out of Hansa, you're running out of Qatar. What's your problem with the European Court? You know, you've got a minor issue which you've chosen to blow up that prison foot. Really, the European Court is coming through with reasonable judgment. So, where next? Just live with where we are. Okay, we'll have a question from this lady as well. Hold, just remember what you're going to say, Michael. And, uh, we'll come back to the panel. Hi. Uh, Lucia Schmidt from Index on Censorship. Um, following on from Michael's question, I'm just curious um, um, given that the European Court has um, played such a crucial role in bringing governments to account with very dire human rights records like Azerbaijan and, and Russia, um, what if, if, if the, the proposals for reforming um, the, and, and increasing the margin of, of, of appreciation, what scenario do you see if that's actually increased? And how, what tools would we have that the UK and other countries have at their disposal? for um, bringing these governments to account. Just briefly, Dominic, do you want to comment um, on, on, on those? Very briefly. Uh, I think Roger makes an interesting historical point, and we can debate the extent to which Strasbourg and the Council of Europe has pacified the eastern border, and in particular, whether it's the EU that's done that, whether it's the Council of Europe or who. I've not seen any serious empirical evidence on that. The one obvious point I'd make is that Russia is outside the EU but inside the Council of Europe and I think its human rights record is getting worse not better. Um, in relation to the issue that I think has been raised by the, the lady here, um, what I think you could quite easily do is amend the European Convention and apply in the procedural provisions a stricter mandate for the court so it focuses more on the, the worst violations of human rights which I suspect all of us in this room agree with and does less quibbling and second guessing of the Supreme Court when we've had three or four appeals on uh, you know, whether it may be Hamza or Katana or whatever else. There's a very good international precedent, by the way. The International Criminal Court has a doctrine of complementarity, which is spelt out in its statute. What that effectively says for war crimes, the ICC should be a court of last resort, where effectively the national institutions break down. Actually, I wouldn't do it exactly like that, but it shows something can be done without ripping up war crimes or human rights in the ECHR context. Okay, let's, let's just get some more questions from the audience. So that lady over there, and then this gentleman here. <coughs> My name is Gabby Charing. I'm a retired solicitor with an interest in this issue. Um, for about the first 15 years in the UK, the convention could only be enforced against the UK government by other state parties to the convention. Um, the Wilson government introduced the right of individual petition, and I recall that it was used by the political right, for instance, to break the trade union closed shop. Uh, when I looked again at the convention the other day, I discovered that there is now a requirement on member states to permit a right of individual petition, and there is no derogation from that. Uh, requirement. I, I think I'm right about that. Uh, it seems to me that when a country has incorporated the convention into domestic law and that country has got a really good working 
system with a genuinely independent judiciary. It isn't clear to me why the right of individual petition is needed, but with the convention worded the way that it is, there's nothing that can be done by the UK except to move for amendment of the convention in such a way that the really bad abusers must still permit a right of individual petition because their domestic judiciary is not in a position to protect rights. That, that's how I would see the problem and the solution, but I don't see that being particularly on the table, and I was just interested that no one had mentioned it. It's a very interesting question that puts paid to my theory of trying to adhere to the convention and not court. <laughs> Let's hear some more questions. Thanks, Sam. Um, Anthony Dworkin with the European Council on Foreign Relations. Um, so I, um, you know, I completely subscribe to the arguments about uh, the margin of appreciation and the importance of the idea, perhaps it should be elaborated and so on. But it seems to me that there is a kind of fundamental point um, at stake in these debates about the, the European Court. Um, and that is the question about whether notion of human rights ultimately implies that the way that states treat their citizens is open to um, adjudication or assessment that there's some responsibility beyond the state to the way that people, you know, the, the authorities within the state treat their citizens. Um, and if we subscribe to a doctrine that ultimately, you know, as a, a democracy, we have sovereignty and a, a dualist theory, I think, <coughs> Dominic Graf was saying, you know, then we're moving away from the idea that there is a kind of international obligation to justify the, how the state, the state treats its citizens. Well, or, or is there? That's the, in a way, that's the question. But, you know, obviously, to follow on from the point that was made before, um, granted that Russia is, you know, is, I completely agree with you, they're moving in the wrong direction. And yet, if we give up this idea of having a kind of impartial assessment sitting outside the state, um, on how the state treats its citizens, we also are giving up a, a standard by which to judge and criticize Russia. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, and, and also coming back to the, <laughs> I wanted to pick up one comment that Michael Pinto-Duczynski said. Um, you referred to uh, ultimately there should be, the, the legislature should be able to say what the political decisions are and possibly in extreme cases override them. And then you quoted the Dred Scott decision from the US. Um, but I wasn't clear whether you were saying that Dred Scott was a political decision or just a very bad decision. Um, and are you saying that ultimately the legislature should be able to override what you call unwise decisions or just decisions where the courts stray into the wrong area? And you know, who is it who gets to decide? I can see a sort of slippery slope here. Uh, okay, but look, I, I, I'm a believer in, the, in checks and balances. Uh, and if, if you're to give considerable power to judges, you need some check against an absolute power uh, of judges, uh, either uh, at national or international level. Uh, and so I'm, I'm afraid I'm a Madisonian in, in, in that. Uh, I, I've seen the organization that you come from, uh, and with reference to Roger Smith, uh, I did ask the European Council uh, on foreign relations uh, to give me empirical evidence as to what happened uh, in Russia uh, on human rights as, uh, as a result of, uh, of Strasbourg cases. And I then sent a reminder, and I never got an answer. Uh, and having been in the States uh, and spoken to some major international organizations pursuing human rights, I did get the view from their experience uh, that they said, well, maybe the Strasbourg Court has had a marginal effect, but no more. I, I think that the rhetoric that, that uh, you would be killing off widows in Chechnya uh, if you d didn't subscribe to the, uh, the, the Strasbourg Court, uh, let's have some serious study of that before we come to conclusions. Uh, uh, the other thing is that if Oh, I do agree that we have international responsibilities, but why only to member states of the Council of Europe? Why don't we have the same responsibilities to Syria, to Jordan. Yemen, Jordan. to uh, uh, Jordan, uh, to many, many other countries? 
uh, that the idea of a, of a European court uh, may well be geographically based on a, a political agenda of having some international European space uh, and developing a European thing. And therefore, if you're to, uh, to base the favor of an international regime uh, on the European court, you've got to explain why the major human rights uh, violations throughout the world you care less about. Austin, do you want to come back? Um, is, is the lady right about the reading of the convention? Uh, yes, yes, she is, but I want to answer Roger, not because I've got an obsession about Roger, <laughs> because she did raise the question of the Eastern territories, or however we refer to them. My unease is that the court is not the appropriate international body to deal either with genocide in the former Yugoslavia or in what happened in the post-communist states further to the east, taking in en route Turkey, which of course is at war with its Kurdish population. And if the court tries to be the firefighter, what do you end up with? You end up with badly investigated cases, and you end up with a bad use of case precedent. In Turkey, it's part of the war that Kurds make an application to Strasbourg. Strasbourg doesn't get on a plane to investigate. What happens is a human rights expert is brought in to say, yes, there was a killing. The army went into this village. Ten people were found dead. And then on the basis of what the human rights experts say, who may or may not have visited the village, who may or may not have visited Turkey, there is a decision made. That is almost an abuse of the process of a court as an English lawyer would perceive it. You need other institutions, including armies. You need diplomacy. You need economic pressure. You need denial of membership of international bodies. You need all the levers that are available to a state. You should not have a court being the principal firefighter on the East. And that is why I think there is 160,000 backlog. That is why I think the court has been broken down by being given too much to do. And that's just a good backdrop to us getting on, creating our own human rights regime and institutions against the backdrop of the convention. But my view is that the Council of Europe will fall away and the European Union will increasingly take front stage. Last word to Jesse Norman. Uh, uh, well, thank you. Uh, before I say that, also, thank you very much indeed for having us along and for being such a good audience. And thank you, Policy Exchange, for, for kind of supporting this. Um, uh, okay, so can I just pick up the point of Boston, because I think it's, it's interesting. Um, and <laughs> sorry, I really disagree. I just completely. Um, you can have um, sovereignty or shared identity without enforcement. And that's the lesson of the Jewish diaspora, right? There's no enforcement there. Um, but people still feel bound by law. And you can have, um, uh, and that's a, a way of thinking about Britain as a, as a force for good in the world. As a, I don't want to be too exceptionist about it, but the rule of law is something that you know, we have an enormously important history of having promoted, although we often breached it. Um, and um, I suppose it's part of my answer to the question about whether or not we're parochial. I, I don't think we are parochial. This discussion is about the nature of those laws in this country and it's in relation to other countries. And with the, with the wide sweep of our of the, of the spread of the rule of law is a profoundly British, in most respects, development. Um, I, uh, uh, on the issue of moral appreciation, I, I share the concern of the lady. Um, of course, the nature of moral appreciation is, is by definition that almost that um, the evil states don't pay any attention anyway. Um, and so it might be, you might get better laws if you were you had more local weight to the, to the ones that are obeyed, and therefore make better decisions, and the overall system might therefore become more reputable. Um, I do think that there's a very interesting question raised by Ed Gordon about the rule of law versus parliamentary sovereignty. We're starting to see a, a kind of meme getting out in Britain that actually what really matters is the rule of law, and, and, that, and that this is a potential countervailing force to, to parliamentary sovereignty um, in Britain. I, I think that's wrong, personally. I think. Um, we have a system in Britain in which Parliament is sovereign. Um, uh, I don't myself think that um, 
um, the rule of law is something which, um, at least as it's by the British courts, um, is available to overturn that as we in our constitution. And if you don't agree, then I refer you to Tom Bingham's book on the rule of law, which makes the case more eloquently and thoughtfully and intelligently than I ever could. Um, the final thing I would say is, um, and, and Mike, I'm afraid of my spirit of disagreement, anyway, I disagree with you as well, if you don't mind. Um, I, I, I profoundly disagree with the idea of a, of a parliamentary or political override over the courts. Let me just give you some examples. Um, uh, you know, um, in most countries where we think about political corruption, the only parts left that potentially are available to be free of corruption are the are judiciary. I mean, take India, for example, the Supreme Court is the one, you know, many people think is the one non corrupt institution within the, within the uh, Indian political system. Imagine what would happen if these mobile licenses that's just found to be in breach of the rule of law um, um, could be overcome by some parliamentary process, which the vast billions of the defeated bidders could then mobilize their parliamentarians to say that the judiciary in Stalin's Russia or in, in Nazi Germany? I, 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 of course, agree. There are many cases in which those judiciaries have been offered. I certainly don't think the solution would have been um, more political influence than the judiciary in Stalin's Russia. You make my point for me, Mike. There's too much political influence in that country that marked the difference. Um, but you, I mean, another example, Tangentopoli in, uh, in, in Italy, you know, the judges are the only places where you can actually think. So I would be very, and even in Dred Scott, you know, um, Taney's disgraceful judgment about uh, a human being uh, being on the first of the chapters. Well, let's not forget that that uh, decision itself could never have been overturned by parliamentary, or uh, not parliamentary, but by a political majority, or by any political process in America in the uh, 1850s, because the consensus didn't exist. Um, so, so I'm afraid I, I profoundly agree with that, and I, and I think that the great genius of this, I, the person I think ought to be in the room, and I'm only sad that he isn't, um, is Montesquieu. Uh, because you know we have we have a separation of powers, and for, if the policy exchange were doing its job properly, he would be here, and we could put the question squarely. But it is it is a separation of powers from which, and our mixed constitution, um, from which we'll get them next time. I think they will, uh, on, on which our system relies, and thank goodness it does. Thank you very much. Um, to the, uh,